Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Tonight, I wanted to share a couple of interesting guitars that I found while surfing on Reverb the past couple of months. Starting with one that showed up a couple of hours ago, what is being billed by Thunder Road Guitars as a 1997 Gibson SGZ Blue Burst. I saw this thing and instantly fell in love, made an offer, got declined. But I was so excited about it, I had to share it with somebody instantly, so I did it on my Facebook page, where I occasionally post good deals like that. I also put it in my YouTube community section. So by the time you guys are watching this video, yeah, it's probably gone. Update? Surprisingly not. Maybe I'm alone on this one. But take a look at this SG. We've got some sort of a weird modified pick guard, we've got a humbucker, we've got a stop bar tailpiece, and you've got two knobs, master volume, master tone. If you've never seen one of these, you're probably losing your mind right now because it's so crazy. But this style of SG actually dates all the way back to the late 80s. From about 1988 through 1990, Gibson did something called the 90 series. There's the V90, there's the E90, which is the Explorer variation, there's the SG90, and then there were also double variations on those. The double meant it had two pickups. Those are some really weird, bizarre guitars. Most of them have like 25 and a half inch scale lengths. We're talking very early. Henry Juskowitz era stuff here where they just didn't know where Gibson fit in the current guitar market until the Les Paul Classic brought things back and slash made people want Les Pauls again. But this color really reminded me of the SG Goddess series or like the Les Paul Goddess even. You just don't see this whole skyburst finish enough I don't think. This is just such a beautiful angelic finish. It's got the matching pick guard. I fell for this one. But going through it it's like oh that style Gibson logo with a crown? And then we flip over to the back, and yes, indeed, they did a complete refinish, including on the neck and the back of the body. Now, normally, when somebody does a complete refin on a guitar, you gotta be really scared because they're likely hiding some sort of a repair. So I go down here and I read they're saying it's a 1997. Well, uh, Trogly, didn't you just say these are late 80s? Okay, so in the late 90s, Henry decided to try again with the SGZ. They gave it like this weird lightning bolt tailpiece, a string through variation. But most importantly, they gave it the cool Z headstock emblem. Oh yeah, and they also made a bass version in case you're a bass guy and you like it. So these guys are saying this SGZ had a Kaler or Floyd Rose tremolo installed, and it's been removed and filled and set up for standard two-pneumatic bridge. Okay, so that made me start to think, is this really the 1997 one? Because if we go here, it's got the headstock of the 80s variation. However, this also looks like it could have been replaced. Like if the headstock had been snapped off, they might have had to have replaced it. You just can't know when you have a complete solid finish. But then they go on saying the string through holes were also filled at the same time. So it's like this one just can't make up which one it was trying to be. And I'm honestly not entirely sure. So I'm betting you can probably see some interesting witness lines under this finish. Or if you can't see it now, you might in the future. But all the weirdness aside, they only want $13.29 for it, plus $100 bucks shipping. But that could be a lot of fun for that kind of money. But before we continue on with the rest of the guitars, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Sweetwater. Sweetwater, it's a great place to buy your gear. They have a used section now even too, but they can hook you up with patch leads, picks, brand new guitars, full recording setups, or you can visit them and record in their own studios. I mean, Sweetwater's got a whole bunch of stuff and is a massive campus that you can visit if you want. They're not just the biggest online gear retailer, like most of you probably know them as. My favorite part about them is you can see what guitar you're buying. So if you got a certain weight restriction, like you got a bad back, that Les Paul has to be sub eight pounds. Trust me, that's hard to find, but sometimes you can find it on here because they tell you. Other times you can just pick out the prettiest one. Whether that means to you that you need the most flamed top or the most planed top. And hey, they also do monthly giveaways. You can check that link in the description if you'd like to enter into those. Thank you, Sweetwater, for being a continuous sponsor of my show. Let's get back to some guitars. Next up, let's cool things off a little bit with just a really sweet Japan limited edition hand-selected custom shop quilt top Les Paul custom. Look at that top. That is ridiculously 3D. And it's not like some of the quilt tops that are just all the same thing. Like, it's got a little bit of a river valley going on over here, and then the incredibly deep quilting right there. And this photo really brings out just how 3D that thing is going to look in person. Like, sometimes there's quilt tops that look like this, they don't move too much in person, but you can just tell this would be a spectacular sight. And normally, I'm not a big fan of the uncovered humbuckers, but it kind of works with all the rest of the black plastics, but this is like a, a trans blue finish, very faded. 
But then you swap over to the back, and I can't tell if that's a dark blue or a purple. Either way, I agree with that color choice, because it just makes the guitar just a little bit more exotic besides just being a nice quilt top. But a dirty fingers in the bridge and probably some sort of a regular PAF style in the neck. Probably a 490R would be my guess. But they didn't do anything crazy for the headstock. I mean, it's just a regular Les Paul custom otherwise. Ebony fretboard, mother of pearl block inlays, all up and down the neck. But no, that's a 2018. Hmm. That might actually be a rich light fretboard instead of ebony. The seller doesn't mention it in the listing. It's probably a rich light, but I swear I see some wood grain right there. But what's unique about their listing here is they say the original buyer purchased it as an investment, so it's very clean, no noteworthy blemishes. But now they're talking about the pickups. I was right with my 490 guess because that's what a regular custom normally has. But if they bought it for investments, why, why, why did they change the pickups? <laughs> I don't know. Next up, this is a Les Paul Jr. from 2011. But what caught my attention is the word flame in the title. Okay, Les Paul Juniors, they normally look like this. Solid colored, can't see through to the wood grain unless you get the TV model. So take a look at this one. And you gotta remember, there used to be like cheap juniors you could buy, and it was very popular to refinish them or do something because they weren't all that expensive. So this one, it's got one of those wrap tail pieces that is now intonatable, and somebody took the finish off of it. And to their surprise, the mahogany underneath actually has some pretty good figuring to it. Flamed mahogany is way more rare than flamed maple. Occasionally you can find it in the 90s and early 2000s, but this one from this era, that is a nice treat. It's a shame it was probably originally covered over in some sort of a solid finish, but it doesn't look like our neck is too crazy or anything like that. But that back, it's enough to be excited for. It makes that example a little bit more special. And ooh, baked maple fretboard. I'd recognize the ringage anywhere. I love baked maple fretboards. They're so soft and smooth. And hey, I'm impressed. They actually got that spec right. Now, is it worth 1500? I'll leave that up to you. I think that's a little bit on the optimistic side since that kind of looks like an amateur refinish job, but maybe in that 900 to 1100 range would be a nice price to pick it up for. Continuing on, you guys remember this from the mod collection a couple of weeks ago? Inspired by the O'Connor designs on the US-1 series, at least that's what I hypothesize. I wanted to show this to you because this was missed out on the stock photos by Gibson. It's actually a black sparkle paint job. And then they have these 80s graphics going on. So all right, there's a little bit more to meet the eye there. However, I would have preferred if this side was sparkly and then they left this area in black. I mean, if they can paint over it, they could have just painted these as black too. But then the back is just regular black. I probably would expect that as sparkly black to make it a little bit more special too. But I'll be curious if we see any more of these designs come out of the mod collection. Next up, I've got one for you lefties. It's an interesting carry green aged model. At least that's what the listing says. So this is by the House of Guitars. They're cool guys. They helped me identify their anniversary model studio that you can learn about in this episode. But correct me if I'm wrong, I see a burst on this. It's like an aging burst where this is like a key lime pie center and then this is like a, a little bit of like a reddish orange tint. I mean, you can see along the edges right here that it's all yellowed over. It's this photo too. And I'm not sure if they ordered it like this or what, because you can see it's a little bit brighter right here, a little bit more worn here. Is that part of the relicking job to this particular one? I wouldn't say I'm a massive fan of how this turned out, but it's not a color you see on a Les Paul too often. And if you're going to do it, having the cream plastics looks pretty good. And then you can see the whole natural back and sides phenomenon with an extra dark fretboard but it's got a little bit of streakiness in it. And I like how the greens and yellows are really being pulled out of the acrylic materials there because of the finish. And then of course they've aged our logo here, but hey, aren't lefties supposed to go the other way? But that is a brand new 2022 model and it's got the medallion on the back. And if you're interested in owning it, they have it posted at 5,200, which is about standard for one of those. I originally clicked on this listing because I thought for sure this is a mislisted 1983 Les Paul Candy Apple Red standard, because that is something that existed. You can check out this video for more. Even if that was the case, 3300 bucks isn't quite a steal steal, but it's an okay price for one of those. So I click on it, it's like, yeah, that, that looks pretty good to me. Keep going through the photos, it's got the gold hardware, it's got a 90s case, so I don't know, maybe they are right, but it looks like the ebony fretboard like these things had. But I get to the headstock and nope, that's definitely the era that they're talking about. Then of course we get to the back, that's the dead giveaway. The original ones had painted backs, but this one actually has some pretty cool like bird's eye figuring right here. But aha, 
They are technically wrong. <laughs> Zoom in on our serial number here. They've dated it as 9 and a 1, 1991. Remember, you have to fact check. Normally, Gibson serial numbers are year, day, 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 year. So if you translate 401 into a maximum of 366 days in a year, if it's a leap year, you get a syntax error. 1994 is the first year for that year, year, and then the rest of this is just a production number. Gibson then used that again in 2014 through 2019. So we were both wrong. It's a 1994 Gibson Les Paul standard. That was probably a limited edition for some shop. And then I learned something new. I know we've talked about Adam Jones and there's people that give me a hard time in the comments, but it's like, this is important because it's a slight correction. I told you guys in the Adam Jones standard review that it's the first time that we had a teardrop Les Paul standard since 1988. And I'm still technically correct because this is billed as a classic. They're just abusing keywords here, putting standard in the title too. But I'd forgotten these things existed. A teardrop shape classic. I mean, that's very close to a standard. It'll just be slightly differently spec, but apparently this was an exclusive run for Sam Ash. And I don't really pay attention to Sam Ash, so that's probably why I didn't remember these, but I did want to bring this to your guys' attention. However, I think nowadays you would be much better off just getting the Adam Jones variation because it's the full-on standard. It's got the Adam Jones affiliation, which should be good for resale value. But the finish on these is a little bit more silver. So if that's what you were going for, maybe you'd want one of these. It actually kind of has an interesting yellowed edge to it. Well, this one's at 2700. It's like, you might as well as go for the Adam Jones at that point. And one last one for you guys today. Here's one of the Heritage 80s, kind of related to the Candy Apple Red standard we were talking about just a little bit ago. I only wanted to share this one with you because it's, it's a nice flame top. It's a beautiful looking guitar and it has been played. Borderline abused at this point, but like all the finishes flaking off of it, you can tell just how yellow it is in so many areas. I mean, that is the clear coat showing. It's slightly bubbled and you're seeing the yellowed clear right there. And the neck, it's got lots of wear, but they had a black light photo on here that shows you where the original finish has chipped and all the finish that has been worn off the neck. Like they even got it out of the wood grain pours in some locations. I think he's trying to show you here that there's no breaks, cracks, or repairs despite being played this heavily. He even still has the original UFO knobs. Those are my favorite knobs of all time. And it's still on the original frets somehow, and they appear to be in okay shape. But what's going on with these pickups? It's like, yeah, I, I don't know, a lot of oxidation in there, but I guess covers have been on and off, so who knows? Definitely had to get an upgraded case at some point in time. But that is number 143, which, hmm, the Heritage 80 series, despite being called Heritage 80, mainly started in 1981. But this one dates to 82 and is really late. Why does it have such an early serial number? That is a question for another day. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.